so much for attending my talk. Um, so today I'm going to cover, if you're already doing DevOps in your organization, how can you adopt DevSecOps model? Before we kick off, I uh, just want to introduce myself. Uh, I'm the founder of WiseFox Security, a company that offers services in offensive security and DevSecOps consulting. Um, I have some experience um, in the pen testing space, as you can see. Um, uh, my passion lies when pen testing, DevSecOps, and AI. Um, uh, so that's some of the InfoSec certs that I've done. Um, that's my Twitter handle, and uh, I do post content on my YouTube channel as well. Feel free to subscribe if you like. Um, these are some of the topics that I want to cover today. Uh, we will kick off with what is DevSecOps and what are the benefits of DevSecOps. Uh, we will look at what are the challenges as security professional we face uh, when we are implementing DevSecOps in an organization. In the second part of the presentation, I will cover what can we do to overcome these challenges, and I will share some real-life experiences and perhaps some tips with you. And um, last but not least, I have put together an open source, um, a pipeline that is using open source tools, um, which is using um, GitLab. With that, let's get into it. So first thing first, why we need to do DevSecOps and what is DevSecOps? So DevSecOps is an approach of, uh, in, uh, uh, sorry, uh, DevSecOps is an approach of integrating security tooling at every phase of the SDLC. It aims to shift security to the far left. So we are considering security at the core of our product development. So security is not considered as an afterthought. We are trying to remove those situations where we are about to go live and somebody says, oh, we haven't got a pen test done. Uh, with the help of DevSecOps, we are trying to identify security vulnerabilities quickly. And if we can identify vulnerabilities quickly, we can also remediate them in a timely fashion as well. DevSecOps provides continuous security assessments. That means every release that we are doing or um, you know, whatever we are releasing in production, we have some sort of security assurance around that because everything is happening in an automated fashion with our security tooling. As an example, these are some of the stages of an SDLT. Developers develop a code, they commit the code, and then that code becomes an artifact, and then we test that artifact for quality testing, integration testing, and if all that passes, we push that artifact to production. And then we sort of go into that maintenance sort of phase. As I was saying, that DevSecOps is a practice of integrating security at every phase of the SDLC, right? So what sort of security activities can we introduce? Well, all of these. So in the far left, as you can see, we can probably kick off with threat modeling. So we can try to identify security issues at a, if we have a very high level design. So we can probably look to find security is issues or risks in our high level design to begin with. Then we can perhaps even ask our developers to use the IDE plugins to find security issues right in their terminals while they're typing code. Or when our artifact is deployed and artifact is running, if it's a web app or an API, we can perhaps run a DAST, which is dynamic application security testing, to perhaps find some low-hanging stuff. Depending on the type of tool that you're using, you can also find more sophisticated issues as well. So that's in a, uh, DevSecOps in a nutshell. So traditional approach. So what I like to refer to this as how we've been approaching security till date. So this is an example CI CD pipeline. Let's say you developed a product, you're about to go live, however, you want to get a pen testing done, right? So you bring in a third party in, they do a pen test, and they find a SQL injection vulnerability. So you know that this application is probably critical to your organization. You want to fix this vulnerability before you go live. So what happens? You go back from where you started. So you go back to your developers, you ask them to fix this vulnerability. I'm just giving an example of one vulnerability, you probably have more. So developers either have to drop what they're working on, or you have to wait. So that means you're probably not going to meet your um, go live dates. OK, so let's look at how this changes if we have DevSecOps, or we have implemented automated security tooling as part of our CI CD. 
Again, we are looking at the same pipeline. However, in this, uh, in, uh, with DevSecOps, we have implemented a security tooling in the build stage, which is a SaaS tool to find security issues at a source code level, right? So developer committed the code, the tool t uh, triggered, and we found that vulnerability in real time. So developers are getting the feedback in real time. We didn't have to wait for a third-party pen test to pick up that vulnerability. I'm not saying that we don't need third-party pen tests. We still need third-party pen tests. However, the velocity of releases, if you're using a DevOps model, you can't keep up with um, if you're just doing one pen test per year or even not. Um, so sometimes, you know, these tools, you may have set these tools to fail the pipelines. You can tune these tools to fail the pipelines. That means that artifact that you built in the build stage wouldn't move to the next phase. So your code is not moving until you fix these vulnerabilities. So as you can see, uh, you know, we want to probably fix these vulnerabilities. However, if you're failing these pipelines because this tool is picking up vulnerabilities, that's going to cause some friction with your DevOps teams. So in the upcoming um, slides, we will probably talk about how we can overcome this challenge. So this is the first part of the presentation now. So we're going to probably cover some of the DevSecOps challenges when you are going to implement this in your organization. And I'll share some um, real life challenges with you. So first thing first is lack, is lack of budgeting. So this is the key, because uh, you probably want to implement DevSecOps program, but you haven't got any budgeting. So that means you can't hire people or skilled people that you probably want to bring into your organization, or you can't bring in a third party into your organization who can help you implement this program. Also, uh, you may not be able to acquire some of the necessary tools that you want. Last but not least, if budgeting is an issue, that means you can't upskill your existing people, you know, if, or if they want to do some certifications, if there's no budget, they can't go on those trainings, and they can't come to these cool conferences. Another challenge that we face is the knowledge gap. So that means first thing could be lack of resourcing because of the budgeting issue. That means you haven't published any security guides, security best practices, or security standards for others to consume as part of your organization. The second challenge is you probably have all of that, but you as a team not running any program where you are sharing that knowledge with other teams. And the third bit is, we as security professionals probably lack the knowledge of how DevOps teams are operating. That means we don't know how these teams are actually pushing their code into production or how they are deploying infrastructure in AWS. Are they using AWS cloud formation templates or are they using Terraform? Or how are they managing the configurations of an already deployed infrastructure? Are they using Ansible or something else? So we just lack that knowledge. Last but not least, um, we probably also lack a program or a platform where all of these teams can come along and can share their knowledge. So these are some of the challenges that we face. So the next challenge that we see is, is the tool chain integration. So this means we as security team may have picked up a tool that we want to integrate into the CI-CD pipelines. However, this tool, when we picked up, we never consulted with the engineering teams. So they are not comfortable using this tool. Or the tool that we picked up requires some sort of manual intervention. But in the DevOps, you know, when you're using DevOps, it's really not practical to click through stuff when you are deploying stuff, you know, automatically. Another thing is that the tools that you have implemented is creating so many false positives or false negatives. That means no one is really looking at the output of these tools because they are not finding any value out of the, uh, you know, from the output of these tools. And last but not least, we are, because we are failing pipelines, because these tools are set to fail the pipelines, that's not flying well with our DevOps teams. So let's look, we, we will look into the second part, what can we do about that? Okay, so what, how can we overcome these challenges? So my advice is, Probably start small and leverage open source tooling. So, what you, so if you're in a very early stage of your DevSecOps journey, perhaps you're trying to prove the value to your organization so you can get some funding, right? So my advice is pick an application 
that is built using a modern framework, and it's not super important to your organization, but uses CI CD. So pick up that application and just try to do one thing right, and that could be just doing threat modeling or integrating a SaaS tool from open source and try to find vulnerabilities using that tool. So even if you pick up 10 or 20% of the vulnerabilities using that tool, it's still better than nothing. So prove the value to your organization. Show them why it is important to have automated security controls as part of your CI CD. And then hopefully, if you get budgeting, then go get that commercial tool. And here, I've listed some of the open source tools that you can use for various security activities. And you can certainly tune these tools to do whatever you like, and you can find more sophisticated vulnerabilities. Another thing that I would recommend is to create a DevSecOps framework. Because this framework is going to help you capture what sort of security capabilities as a security team you can demonstrate to your whole organization. What I tend to do is I would align my security activities with the existing CI CD stages that our um, engineering teams already have. As you can see here, in the continuous build integration and testing phase, we've integrated SaaS and SCA tooling which is going to find vulnerabilities in third-party dependencies as well as in your source code. So similarly, I would highly recommend that you create a DevSecOps framework for, for your organization. And it's also going to help you capture the roles and responsibilities of each team. So when should teams should come to the security engineering team? And you should specify that perhaps security engineering team can help you triage security issues every time these tools pick up vulnerabilities. Now, this point is really, really important, like establishing a security champions program. Perhaps we all, all know that it's super hard to find skilled security people, or you know, due to budgeting, we can't recruit more and more people. And from experience, I can tell you uh, that the organizations that run the security champions program, they do reap the benefits of that program. And again, from experience, I can tell you so many organizations start this program and one month down the line, nobody really knows about this program anymore because you're not, you haven't had a proper structure around this program. So let's look at what can we um, do about this program and how can we implement this successfully. So the first thing first is who makes a good security champion? Well, anyone who is passionate about security. However, these people need to belong to the engineering team. They could be developers, they could be architects, or they could be holding some you know, high-level position in that team. Also, you don't need to worry too much about their security skills at this point, because you can always train them. Then, you need to set a clear goal for this program. You need to um, tell your security champions to be able to do threat modeling, or they should be able to triage security issues. So you really need to set a clear goal for this program. So whatever goal you've set for your security champions, you have to train them accordingly. So if your security champions are going to help you triage security issues, you have to train them accordingly. For example, they probably need to go through some specific application security training. And then you have to reward their extra efforts. You need to remember that they do have a day job, but they are putting their extra time and effort to run the security champion program and be part of that team. You can send them to these conferences. There could be monetary rewards, and you can give them bonuses and stuff. And OWASP has a really good guide around security champions if you want to implement security champions program in your organization. So we looked at, um, you know, the tools can be set to fail pipelines, but if you're failing your pipelines because the tools are picking up like low severity issues and also for critical issues, that's not going to fly well with the DevOps team. So let's look at how we can use a risk-based approach here. So first thing first, you probably need to understand where you stand in terms of your DevOps, DevSecOps maturity. When did you implement these security tools as part of your CI CD? Have they been operating from last couple of years or last couple of months? You need to answer those questions. So once you know your DevSecOps maturity, you need to understand what are your crown jewels that you're trying to protect, right? And then you have to categorize them. 
You can use these sort of categories where platinum being the highest priority and the bronze being the lowest. You need to categorize your crown jewels into these sort of categories. And once you have defined, or sorry, categorized your crown jewels, you have to define a risk appetite for these categories. As an example, for platinum-based um, assets, you probably want to fix critical, high, and medium vulnerabilities before you go live or before you deploy these products to the market. And you can see other categories. Now, that's fully dependent on your organization. So that means now when you tune your security tools to start fail the pipelines, they are using the risk appetite model. You're not just failing the pipeline, you know, just like that. And if someone complains, you can always fall back on this model if you define this, it this way. Measure your success. You can use this metrics if you're already using DevSecOps or doing DevSecOps in your organization. You can probably use some of these things to measure your success, like how well are you doing with that program? How many vulnerabilities are you finding using these tools that you have? Or what is your coverage looks like? How many applications are you covering using your tools? How many false positives these tools are producing? That's going to show how well you are tuning your security tools as well. How long it takes for, you, for these tools to pick up vulnerabilities as well. So there is so much you can do and measure yourself against. So as I said, I probably want to show you a working demo of this pipeline. So just to, as a, to highlight what this pipeline covers. So this pipeline has five different stages. It's holding a vulnerable Python application. Um, in, the very, uh, in the build stage, I've implemented two security tools uh, to detect third-party uh, dependencies who are which are vulnerable. And then I'm using Truffle Hog to detect secrets in the source code. In the test stage of my pipeline, I am running Bandit, which is specific to Python-based applications, so it can find vulnerabilities at the source code level in Python. And I am building an artifact, which is a Docker image. And once that artifact is built, I'm pushing that artifact to Docker Hub and using Sneak to scan that Docker image. And once it's, the scanning is completed, I am pulling that Docker image down and deploying that Docker image to this deployment server. So it's running as a container. In your case, uh, in my case, this is just another virtual machine on my laptop. But in your case, it could be an EC2 instance or a container running on a Kubernetes cluster. So once the, uh, the image became a container it's running that is accessible on that IP address, then I'm pointing uh, dastardly from the creators of Burp Suite and Zap, which are both are DAST-based tools, to scan um, that application for vulnerabilities. And last but not least, I'm just running Nmap scan against that IP address to see what ports are open, just for the sake of it. Um, so let's quickly look at um, what we've got in terms of our pipeline. So I'm logged into GitLab. This is where my lab is hosted. And the most critical file in GitLab is the gitlab-ci.yaml file. This, this file contains the, you know, pretty much all of the code of this uh, um, lab. So I've, de uh, I've, uh, sorry. I've defined these five stages here. And just to show you quickly like how easy it is to run these scans, in one line here, I am pulling the Docker container for Zap using the baseline scan of Zap and scanning that host, which is the, the web application that I'm talking about in this context, and the, producing the output in zap-output.xml file. Similarly, dastardly also set in the same way as well. So this is the code of the whole pipeline. I can click on it. and can show you these are the five different stages that we have. We can look at the, perhaps the result of, results of Zap, what it has found. By the way, here's the, uh, the scan results of Snake. This application is vulnerable. So here, this is the Zap output. It found 21 security issues, and 44 tests are passed. We can perhaps look at some of them. So for example, Zap highlighted that one, some of the JavaScript libraries are vulnerable, and HTTP only flags are not set for the cookies. So that's one example. Similarly, we can look at Bandit, which is a SAS tool. And Bandit has picked up three issues as well. So it picked up that there is a shell injection, and 
it found there is a hard-coded secret in the source code, and there is a SQL injection in this code base. So this is all happening without me clicking through. These tools are fully integrated into the pipeline. They are being triggered. However, I set my pipeline node to fail because my DevSecOps maturity is not uh, you know, to that level. So as you can see, it's super easy to configure these tools. And let's just quickly look at the results of Nmap scan as well. And here, Nmap picked up two ports, 22 and 8,000. So if you want to harden your web server, you can go and shut down that port 22, because 8,000 is probably where your application might be listening on. So yeah, so this is, you know, I just wanted to sort of quickly demonstrate to you that it is super um, easy to configure these tools. I'll probably make that as a YAML file available to you if you find some value out of that. And let's go back to the presentation. I think just got like last few things to share with you. Go full screen. So last few helpful tips that I want to share. I just sort of uh, collated them here. Automate where you can. Uh, shorter scan intervals, what that means, that means uh, if your security tooling is taking more than five minutes, probably it's not going to find much space in the CI CD. So make sure that your security to tools are tuned enough and your scans are finishing under five minutes. Um, yes, yeah, so you have to tune your security tools. As security teams, we probably need to create more guardrails than gates. Um, and if your DevSecOps maturity is low, don't fail the pipelines. Um, collaborate more with people and just be nice in general. And don't forget the security activities on the far right once your artifact is deployed. Uh, you still need to worry about pen testing, vulnerability assessments, and whatnot. And I would highly recommend that you automate some of the API security tests as part of your CI CD. Write security tests and you'll be surprised how many API related bugs you're going to pick up as part of your pipelines. And that's me. Thank you so much. And hope you found this presentation useful. Busted.